Hello and welcome back to the Domestic Cricket Podcast. I'm your host for today, Caleb Bland, and today's guest is none other than Ryan Bell, a superstar of international cricket who's played one test, 18 ODIs and 19 T20 internationals for Zimbabwe, scoring over 500 international runs and a handful of wickets. Ryan is a powerful batting all-rounder who's known for his big hitting. Ryan, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast, mate. Now, take me back to where it all began for you. What was your upbringing like in Zimbabwe and where did you grow up? In an area called Headlands, um, on a farm. Um, massive, massive open gardens, massive lands, um, along with two brothers. Um, and yeah, pretty much motorbikes, fishing, you know, anything outdoors that was, that was right up our street. And how did you get into cricket? Um, I started cricket when I was three years old. Um, my grandpa was the one that actually taught me. Um, he used to coach like the Zimbabwe under 14s and all that back when it was Rhodesia days. Um, so yeah, pretty much, you know, spending as much time with my granddad as possible. Um, and yeah, learning all the tips and tricks, you know, the good old traditional way. <laughs> and uh, how did you get into the Zimbabwe uh, setup? Obviously, you played in the under 19. World Cup, but before then, how did you find your way down that pathway? Um, well, I just played, uh, you know, your standard schoolboy cricket. Um, and then from then on, we had the interprovincials. And I was pretty much in the Zimbabwe setup since I think under 14. Um, I made all of the national um, age group teams, so from under 14, 16, 17, and so on. Um, and yeah, very fortunate to be in the national team and enjoying what I'm doing. <laughs> and so, as I just touched on, you were a part of the under-19 uh, team for Zimbabwe at the 2014 uh, under-19 World Cup in the UAE. What was that experience like as a whole, and how did you perform yourself? Um, it was a really, really nice uh, location to have a World Cup, first of all. Um, I think I, w- I went to the one before that as well, which was actually in Australia. So, I was very fortunate to, to, to be able to play in both of those countries. Um, I would say UAE was very flat. It was very nice to bat on. Um, I didn't score a bucket load of runs. I scored a bit of runs. Um, I think I kept getting starts and stuff. I think we scored, I scored a 70 or something against Australia in the warm-up game. Um, I think I got a 50 or 60 against Namibia or something. Um, but no, it was really good. I mean, you, you often find at those tournaments, there's a lot of like raw cricketers coming through. So there'll be like very fast bowlers and stuff coming through, like your Rabadas, your Ngidis and all that, they were there. Um, you know, obviously now they've honed their skills and they're a lot more accurate and skillful and stuff. But, you know, back then, those 19s World Cups, everyone's trying to, you know, trying to get their speeds up, you know, trying to hit the 140, 150 marks and stuff like that. So it's, it's really exciting. And I think that was the first, you know, real taste of, of playing at that higher level and stuff. So that yeah, was very good for youngsters coming through. And what tournament... Uh, did you enjoy more of the 2012, I think, in Australia or the 2014 in the UAE? It's a really tough one. Um, I love both places. Um, I think I'll probably have to say Australia. I just, I just loved everything about it. Um, yeah, it was very, very well run. Both tournaments were very well run. Um, but yeah, just probably being able to get out more. I think in Australia, we were able to not just, you know, the venues that we played at and stuff, but we were able to kind of, you know, go, I think we were in Brisbane in Townsville um, and another place. can't really remember off the top of my head, but it was nice to get around. Um, whereas when we were playing the, the one in Dubai um, and Abu Dhabi, I think we were just situated in Abu Dhabi the whole tournament. Um, so no, it was, both were good, but I think I'd choose the 2012 over the 2014. And you mentioned some big names, Rabada and Nagidi. Who are some of the other um, big names that you played against and with in that tournament? Um, we had, I think, Quinton de Kock um, was the one before. Um, ben McDermott, um, Jake Duran from the Aussie team. There's the really good mates with Benny, still keep in touch with them. Um, she she's quite a lot uh, from South Africa. I think there was Ngidi, Rabada, Felakwayo, um from India. I think they had Sanju Samson um, and that other short guy, Safras Khan, who plays for the RCB. 
Um, it's quite a chirpy, funny chap. Um, which other players were there? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few big names. Um, I'm forgetting quite a lot, but it was a very good, you know, kind of base for a lot of us guys that, you know, in our mid-20s and stuff now, we're trying to establish ourselves in international cricket. So it's really good. And after uh, the 2014 tournament, you had a few years back in Zimbabwe and you made your one-day debut for Zimbabwe, um, the national men's team against Afghanistan at Harare Sports Club. Uh, did you feel like, uh, this was in 2017, did you feel like you were ready to represent Zimbabwe at the highest level? Yeah, so I was actually due to make my debut a year before that. Um, I, I tore my ACL uh, about two days before I was going to make my debut against India. Um, so then, yeah, that put me back, I think, 10, 11 months, which was very, very, very unfortunate timing. But it's just such as life, I think, with, you know, professional sportsmen and stuff. Um, so, yeah, when, when the time came in 2017, I was itching at the bit. I was just so ready. Um, I'd been scoring quite a bit of runs in domestic cricket and stuff. I scored quite a lot of runs against Bangladesh and Afghanistan and the A-side tours. And I was just really rearing to go. So it was good to get the opportunity. And what were your, some of your memories from your debut match? Oh, I hated my debut. I hated it. Um, I think we ended up losing by three runs. And I'm probably the reason for it, to be honest. Um, we fielded very well. Um, I think we restricted Afghanistan to about 220. Um, and then we were batting. Um, and I think I came in at three or four. Um, and we lost a few quick wickets. And then we we're actually behind because it was then a rain affected game. And it's always one of those horrible things. You know, you lose a couple of wickets, then it rains. All of a sudden, we were behind on Duckworth Lewis. And then Myself and Craig Irvin did really well. We got ahead of the duck with Lewis by about six, seven runs. And then I lost my wicket. And then the very next ball, we got called off for rain. So we were like two or three runs behind the duck with Lewis. So we ended up losing the game. And ultimately ended up losing the series 3-2. So, yeah, it's one of those things. But memorable, but also something I don't want to remember too well. <laughs> Now, in September of the same year, you made your T20 international franchise debut playing for the MA Knights in the uh, Afghan T20 League. What's, the, it's, what's it like playing in Afghanistan? Because obviously it's still quite a very unsettled country. What's it like um, not only being there off the field, but also on the field? You've got some very bright talents in the um, Afghanistan ranks. What was it like the, as the whole tournament as a whole? Um, the tournament has run well. Um, we stayed at a really nice hotel. I mean, obviously, with everything that went on and stuff, it was a bit unfortunate in terms of, you know, the players feeling a little bit unsafe and whatnot. But Afghanistan has got, honestly, they, they could have, you know, their the national team, their A-side team, their B-team. They are so strong. They've got so much depth and talent that people don't even know about. It's, it's scary, you know, how much youngsters that are bowling Chinamans, that are these mystery leg spinners. There's so many coming through the ranks, um, which is very exciting for Afghanistan. And I mean, I think it's, you know, a lot of the world are now seeing that, you know, these smaller nations have got these hidden gems in terms of players that are coming through. So it was a very good tournament to mix it up. I think in our, in our team, we had, um, I had Skander Raza, who was from Zimbabwe as well. And then you had Mohammed Nabi, who was our captain. Um, and a couple of other big names like Dalat Zadran and Naveen. Al Haq. So it was really good mix it up with those guys and become good close friends with them. And yeah, we, we end up seeing a lot of the Afghan players recently. So we are quite close with them. And uh, the same year, uh, just at the end of the year, you also caught up for Zim the Zimbabwean test squad for their first match against South Africa since 2005. And this match uh, would be, it'd also be the first official four day match since 1973. Not only that, it was also a day-night fixture, a pink ball test. Now, how did you find about your find out about your selection in the squad, and what were some of the emotions? Not only you felt, but uh, the ones close to you, like your family. It was very special for me. Um, it was it was quite nice because I had my whole family there to watch my debut, um, and just you know, obviously parents and all that trying to make a living and stuff that I haven't been very lucky in terms of having them being able to, to watch many of my international games, but 
for my test debut, they were all there. It was really nice. So I was trying to, you know, put on a spectacle and stuff. Um, I got told, I think, about a de- two days before we were going to start. Um, I had a good a warm-up match against the A side. I think I scored a 60 and a 50 or something. Um, and Dale Stain and all those guys were playing that game. Um, so it was, I was ready. I'd prepared well. I was in very good nick. Um, but playing at a pink ball under lights is absolute chaos. It's, it's a nightmare. Um, I think as you've seen, like a lot of the, the test scores that have come out from these pink ball tests, they haven't been high scoring games. You know, the bowlers obviously love it. They have a field there. Um, but it's, it's just so funny. You get a lot of the batters that are just standing there and they're just, I can't even see the ball. I can't. <laughs> so it's, 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 it, it is a bit of a one-sided thing, to be honest. Um, but no, it was, I was in such good nick. Scored lots of runs in the, the, the warm-up match. But unfortunately, I did the hard work, you know, in the first night. I got through the night session and then I went and nicked off early in the morning where it was supposed to be easy. So, yeah, bit bittersweet, but it was, it was a very special experience to be a part of. Now, I don't think Zimbabwe has any grounds uh, with lighting suitable to play night matches. So how did the team go about preparing for this match? And especially considering it's your first time with a pink ball, first day-night match, and also against the likes of South Africa, as you said, with Rabada, the Staines, Morkles, just such a talented bowling lineup. How did you prepare for it? Uh, it's unfortunate. It's just one of those things where Zimbabwe are going to be always on the back foot in terms of playing day night games. We don't obviously have the fixtures. I mean, you know, the facilities here. Um, but no, we went there before. We, we were in South Africa for about a week, a week and a half before the actual test. Like I said, we played the warm up game. So it's just kind of, you know, that's, the, that's the, the reality of it. That's the situation. I think you just kind of prepare the best you can, you know, in the night times. Um, and I think it was the, the most the most difficult thing was you know the fact that the ball was swinging very like quite a lot early on during the day, and then you've got to go through the period of you know that dusk where it's like five six p.m. where it's starting to get dark, so you can't really see it that well. And then all of a sudden at night time you get a bit of dew and stuff, and it starts swinging again. So like you're kind of facing like in every session you're facing different difficulties and elements and stuff. So no, we just yeah we trained in the evenings and stuff like that before. Um, but like I said, it's, it's just one of those things where Zimbabwe is always going to be on the back foot. Now you touched on it before. Uh, there was a three-day day-night tour match against the Cricket South Africa Invitational Eleven in Zimbabwe. You were selected to play in the match, and in your first innings, uh, you made a very gritty twenty-six, and in the second innings, uh, you came in trailing by ninety-one, um, already three wickets down. However, you went on to make a brilliant 51, um, held up one end and helping Zimbabwe to get a reasonable lead of 152. Do you think that innings helped you get picked um, for the actual 11 in the test match a week later? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think you, you, you can never deny form. You know, form is always something that you want to carry on into a match. Um, and, yeah, I think, I think I'm not sure what happened, what led up towards that tour and stuff like that. Um, but I just remember having a lot of good chats with uh, Lance Klusner, who was our batting coach at the time, and just picking his brain and stuff like that. And obviously being in his home country, you know, the conditions. And I just, I prepared so hard. You, we kind of, everyone kind of knows South Africa's tactics in terms of they're going to try and bump you, bump you, and then give you a fuller ball to try and nick your sort of thing. You know, they're very, very fast, very aggressive attack, and they're very skillful. Um, so now just preparing as much as we could with Klusner and stuff like that, that kind of put me in good stead. So yeah, good form, can't really deny it. So just good. And uh, on Boxing Day 2017, it was match day. Uh, you were presented your test cap by none other than Brendan Taylor, one of Zimbabwe's current legends. Were you nervous when, you, when, it, when it really hit you, when you realised you're actually going to go out and play a day-night test match in front of thousands of people in Port Elizabeth, against the likes of, you know, your Rabadas, your Morkels and A.B. de Villiers and the likes of them. How, how do you feel just before uh, you went out? Because obviously Zimbabwe fielded first. How do you feel? Are you, yeah, the first, like, probably first maybe 45 minutes to an hour, you're always very jittery, very excited. And you're almost like, shucks, I don't really want the ball to come to me too much, you know. Um, but no, nah, like, I'd obviously made my debut 
probably a year before that sort of thing. So I'd, I'd gone through all the scenarios, the, the pressures and the situations. So making your debut a year later kind of thing, you know, you kind of prepared for it. You really, you've already been playing at that level. Um, but yeah, so you still get nervous. I mean, even, even now, any match that you play from now on, you know, it's, it's an international cricket match. You know, there's a lot at stake um, and we all get nervous. doesn't matter if it's Brendan Taylor or it's, you know, Wesley Madevera or whatever. It's, everyone gets very nervous. Um, so, no, it was very special to receive the cap from BT. He's obviously a Zimbabwean legend. Um, so, no, it was, it was awesome. Now, Zimbabwe bowled uh, extremely well. They restricted South Africa 9 for 309 before they declared uh, just before um, uh, stumps on day one. Now, Zimbabwe came to the crease uh, hoping to survive the night session. Unfortunately, uh, when it was your time to bat at number five, they were three for 11, and Brendan Taylor was walking back to the sheds. What was it like then, walking out, having the face, like your Rabada and stuff, bowling 145 yeah. for the pink ball? Yeah. No, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, like I said, I was very lucky to have faced, you know, staying in those guys before in the, the practice game. Um, it just kind of kicks in, you know, your, your instinct, you're like, you got to do it, you know, you, you fight or flight. This is the time, you know, it's now or never. Um, and so it's like, whenever I go out to bed, I always think to myself, you know, it's always a good opportunity to kind of showcase the skills and talents that I've got. Um, so yeah, you, you're always, always nervous and it's not ideal, you know, going in early on, you know, in the night session. Um, South Africa were very clever in terms of declaring then and still having a crack at us. You know, they could have, we probably didn't really want to get, you know, as many wickets as we did in their night session. You know, we almost wanted to make sure that we were only batting the next day. Um, but I, I, I stayed there and I was with Javi and it was quite funny because Javi came in as a night watchman and he, he kept, you know, scratching his head. He's like, really, I can't see the wall. I don't know what's going on here. Um, you know, I was trying to give him a game plan and then <laughs> he was, yeah, it was just good chats back and forth and it was, it was good fun. Um, but no, it was, yeah, it was a good challenge, exciting things. So as you said before, you made it through the night, uh, unfortunately got out for 16 uh, early the next day and um, Zimbabwe were bowled out for 68. Uh, and in the second innings, uh, unfortunately, you made it dark. Do you feel like... Uh, you would have performed better if it wasn't a day-night match. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, those 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 pink balls—they that's horrible. Balls were honestly flying all over the place. Guys were absolutely hooping it in, hitting the pitch, and then just seeming away. You know, balls off a length were going over guys' shoulders. It was it was tough. It was real tough. Um, but it's a challenge. You know, that's that's international cricket. You gotta you gotta step up. Um, you gotta make a plan. Um, but yeah, I mean, we always get more opportunities down the line. That's just the way cricket is. You know, it's, it's tough. You only get one opportunity to bat. So you got to make the most of it, eh? <laughs> and in that same uh, season, 2017-18, uh, uh, you're obviously playing uh, in the Logan Cup and you were the highest run scorer for your side, the Rising Stars that year. And uh, in one of your best innings of the tournament, you got... 134, just 181, uh, including two sixes and 13 fours. And this innings, you probably remember, you were given out obstructing uh, the ball, which is um, obviously a very bizarre fashion to get out. What was going through your head? And how, talk us through the whole um, oh, lead up to the ball and what happened. Yeah, it's something I'll, I'll still argue with the, the guys to this day. Um, Basically, I played a reverse sweep um, and the ball got stuck in my pad and like, I kind of grabbed the ball, gave it to the keeper and then like a couple of them appealed sort of thing and they were like, oh, is it handled ball? Is it a, like, what is it like handled ball or obstructing the field or something? I can't really remember, but yeah, the guys, they kind of, it was, I was in such good nick. I was scoring runs, like I said, like you said, scored a ton and stuff and they couldn't really get me out. Um, so for them to find any opportunity, they're obviously going to jump on that. So I was livid that I got given out and science a bit bitter, but, you know, it's part of cricket. <laughs> Don't touch the ball with your glove. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Um, so in that season, you ended up scoring 401 runs in just five matches. What was the key to your success throughout that whole tournament? 
Um, I think I touched on it earlier, just having good chats with uh, Lance Clues now. Um, and it was, it was quite frustrating because back then, you know, I'd, I'd been given a few opportunities with the national side. Um, and it wasn't really ideal in terms of me coming into bat. You know, in the one-day squad, I think I was batting like seven or something. And in the test, I think I batted five or six. Um, so it's not really a position that I've batted my whole life. I've always preferred to bat, you know, three or four. But I think just coming to terms with the fact that, you know, it is what it is. We've got, you know, Craig Irvin, Sean Williams, Kanaraza, Ben and Taylor, all those guys are batting up at the top. So you just kind of got to bite the bullet, accept the fact that your time will come. So I think I was just kind of in a bad mental place and then just you know saying to myself it's a fine you know it's okay you get your chance but just you know crack on and control what you can control so just i think it was just more like a mental shift and just good chats that i had with guys around me and the next summer um you toured bangladesh for a uh tri series in uh in the t20 format uh with bangladesh zimbabwe and afghanistan now in one of the matches uh zimbabwe was struggling you came to the crease and uh, you had to face Shakib Al Hassan, who at the time was the best all rounder in any format in the world. And you managed, uh, I've seen these highlights and it was some amazing hitting. You managed to score 30 off just six, off just his six deliveries in that over. What was, what was the whole experience um, in that over like? And what was going through your head? Were you just seeing ball hit ball? Yeah, I think when you're in your best, Nick, you are see ball hit ball. Um... I think we, we did have a, obviously, before every game, we have our batting meetings and our discussions. And we try and have matchups in terms of, you know, okay, for example, Shakib is a left arm off spinner. I'm a left handed batter. So it means he's going to be turning the ball into me. Um, so it's kind of a good matchup. Um, you know, it's a bit more favorable, whereas, you know, you don't really want a right hander hitting across the line sort of thing. And like you said, we were also, you know, behind in terms of the run rate. You know, we were a few wickets down, with not many overs left. Um, just kind of, you know, now or never. Um, I'd given myself a few balls to get in. Um, and yeah, the time was just time to explode. It was quite good because I, I kind of, you know, I was reading the field and everything was just, you know, going to plan, you know, getting inside the line. Where's that field at square leg, put it behind him. Yeah, just trying to, you know, read the game and good execution, I think. <laughs> and what was... what was it like playing in Bangladesh that whole series? Because there was some massive crowds there, even for... Uh, the games where it was just you and Afghanistan playing, there's still massive turnouts. What was what do you f- uh, find it playing in such a cricketing mad nation as Bangladesh? Obviously, Zimbabwe tend to travel there a lot. So, what's that like? Oh, it's awesome. I love I love the crowds. The bigger the crowd, I mean, the better the bigger the spectacle. Um, and you always want to, as a cricketer, you always want to you want to go out to win, and you always want to go and put out a performance for the crowd because I mean, ultimately, that's what we're playing for. You know, a bit of pride and a bit of respect and stuff um so no you just thrive off those opportunities um and it's good i mean this they're cricket crazy nation and it's it's good to see i mean you get it with all of the asian countries um so no it's, it's really nice to go and you know be around that atmosphere that's created um it's good buzz it's good to play cricket in. and uh after that series uh you were selected to play uh, for the challenges in the Bangladesh Premier League, which is one of the biggest T20 uh, competitions in the world. What was it? How excited were you being picked for the challenges and being picked in such a high class, high profile, well followed tournament? And what are some of your favorite memories from the competition as a whole? Um, oh, it's something that us cricketers were always striving to work towards. We always want to you know, get bought in these leagues and stuff like that. It does help with the bank balance and stuff, um, which is always going to put you in a, in a good place. Um, it was so awesome. I mean, we had guys like Chris Gale, you know, Lendl Simmons, Keserick Williams. We had so many big named players in our team. Um, Liam Plunkett, you know, all these guys that who, you know, you kind of create a good relationship with. So it's not just at the, you know, at the ground and stuff like that. You know, you, you're with them the whole day. We're playing cards until, you know, 1 a.m. every night. And, you know, you're still WhatsApping the guys, you know, congrats for this, you know, how things going. And, you know, ask them for a bit of help. Yeah, you, you know, you feed off each other. Um, I think the best memory was, I mean, we, we did really well in the tournament. We won quite a lot of games. And unfortunately, just through international 
you know, um, call ups and stuff like that myself. And I think our opener, um, Avishka Fernando was doing really well. A few guys had to leave. Um, so you don't kind of, you know, we had that bond for, you know, a good three quarters of the tournament. And then a few of us having to go away and then other international players to come into the fold. You know, you kind of, it kind of upsets the balance a little bit, but it was, you know, they created the owners and the, the managers of the, the, the team. They created such a good family environment. Um, you know, we had so many good barbecues or brides, whatever you call it, um, dinners, get togethers. Um, and I mean, it was, it was quite a tough period because it was also Christmas and New Year's where you're usually with family and stuff. So to spend that with, you know, your, your teammates and all that. And the owners did really well to kind of, you know, incorporate, you know, everyone together and stuff. Um, I think in terms of my, my favorite memory, um, I think I'd, I had a couple of, I had a couple of uh, good bowling spells. I think there was one match where I bowled like one over and I think went for one run and I got two wickets. It kind of changed the game quite a bit. Um, and there was another game where I think, I think I took a couple of decent catches. Um, yeah, it was, it was such an awesome tournament. Um, I mean, just cherishing the whole thing as experiences that you, you take forward for the rest of your life. And when it comes to 2020, um, a team like Zimbabwe usually doesn't have many international tours at the best of times, but they managed to have a biosecure tour of Pakistan in Pakistan. Um, what, was, what was it like being selected uh, for that, obviously, free one days, free T20s. Um, you only managed to play in the T20s. But what was the whole experience like? What's it like inside a biosecure bubble? Is it any different um, to, you know, travelling to Bangladesh without coronavirus? Like, what, what are some of the restrictions that you, you guys had? Oh, it's just massively different. It's, to be honest, it's horrible. No one really enjoys these biosecure bubbles. I think you, I'm sure you've seen on the news and stuff, a lot of players are opting out of tours and series because you, you're just spending a lot of time, you know, away from family and just being stuck in a confined room, really. Um, kind of hard work with us is we had to, we had to isolate ourselves in a bubble here in Zimbabwe for about 10 days, I think, before we left. Um, so you kind of, it's like one floor of a hotel, you know, your bus and then the cricket ground. And that's kind of all you ever do. Um, so getting to Pakistan was, was good because obviously no one's really taught Pakistan in a long time. But with it being in a biosecure bubble and all that, it didn't really feel like we were in Pakistan because there was no crowd. So you, you're just playing. Um, and it's kind of almost feels like a training session in a sense because there's no crowd, there's no atmosphere. But then you're still kind of, you know, trying to perform at that high level because there's a lot at stake. Um, so you just got to pinch yourself, remind yourself what's at stake. Um, but yeah, it was, it was good. I think hopefully we can go again soon um, and play under different circumstances. Um, you know, as cricketers, it's quite nice because we, we do, and we are very fortunate enough to travel a lot of countries in the world. Um, so you always want to kind of make the most of it by going out, have a coffee, go to a restaurant, um, maybe visit some historic sites or whatever it may be, you know, just get out the hotel and experience a bit of, different things because there's always more to more to life than just the cricket itself um so yeah hopefully this whole situation changes soon and we can get back to a bit of normality i guess eh? um, yeah what's it like in zimbabwe at the moment ever since coronavirus first entered the country i know south africa is um pretty bad as we speak what's it what's it, what's the situation like in zimbabwe and what, how have you been keeping yourself busy and what's what what restrictions have you, um, you know, had to deal with over there? Yeah, so we, we kind of, um, we, we've had a, a few stages. We had a, a, an initial national lockdown and then things kind of eased off. You know, we, weren't, we were actually very fortunate at the beginning. We weren't really hit hard with coronavirus. Um, so everything went back to kind of normal. We just had a curfew sort of thing, but all businesses were operational and everything. You just kind of got to wear your mask, which is very understandable, very reasonable. Um, but then, yeah, I think kind of, you know, coming the last couple of months, like you said, like similar to South Africa, we have been hit quite hard. Um, so you do get a lot of, you know, people that are not, I haven't had anyone directly related to me, anything like that, but you do hear of, you know, a friend and stuff like that, that's unfortunately passed and all that. Um, so it is very strange 
But I think the one good thing that I that has managed to keep me a bit sane was uh, I did start a business, um, a pajama business, <laughs> um, through lockdown, and it's it's just been really good because I mean you know it's kept me busy, kept my mind you know going, and it's nice to also have another you know kind of income to to keep things going. So yeah, I'm very fortunate. So tell us more about the pajama business. Do you make them yourself or just sell them, or how's it all work? So no, we we got in a shop. Um, we we kind of bring in, uh, we import the goods from mainly from South Africa, um, a few things from the UK, and a few things from China. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's it's, it's really good. Um, you know, we we it's something that you wouldn't really associate an international cricketer with selling pajamas, but yeah, it's it's been very very fun. Um, having to learn about all the different garments, the materials and stuff like that. Um, so no, it's been good. Um, and it's been very busy and it's been very successful. So yeah, you never know, see, see what, what can happen. <laughs> and I've noticed um, on your social media, you've been involved in a lot of ads recently. How, what's, how's that been like? And what, how much preparation goes into the ads or do you just kind of rock up on the day and film um, or do you have to kind of practice your lines and what's, what's, what's some of the stuff you have to do? Um, for yeah. Um, I think I've got to give credit to my agents and stuff like that for kind of sorting those deals out. Um, yeah. You, you, you don't really, we're not actors at the end of the day, we're cricketers. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we we're still average Joes. Um, so no, getting asked to do, you know, a bit of filming and stuff like that yeah you kind of they you kind of get told what to wear what you're doing um you know maybe the day before we get a kind of script of how the day pans out um and then yeah you kind of got a almost freestyle you gotta you know just mix it up as you go and yeah <laughs> see what happens really it's it is quite funny um some things you don't really like doing and some things you do um i kind of guess you know it's just the environment that you know he was videoing or whatever kind of provides so yeah it's different but yeah it's good and before we let you go ryan we've got some quick questions here what's your favorite uh innings you've ever played for zimbabwe or for any franchise you've been a part of my favorite innings um i think probably like you mentioned earlier the one that sticks very close to me is you know obviously hitting Shakib for 30 and that over. Um, it's, it has brought along a lot of, you know, other opportunities like playing in the BPL and stuff. So that's probably one that I would say is probably the closest to me at the moment. And what about your favourite bowling performance? Favourite bowling performance? Um, I think maybe bowling against the UAE, maybe when I got, I think I got a four for or something like that. Um, bowled really well. Um, and yeah, it's just something that I haven't really been, you know, given the ball as a, a full-time bowler. It's something I'm still working on. Um, so no, to to get four four wickets or three wickets or two wickets or just to provide a breakthrough, it's always good. So probably I'd say the four four against UAE. And what's coming up for Zimbabwe cricket? There's talks of a tour to Afghanistan. Um, have you heard any news as a player? And what can the fans expect coming up? For Zimbabwe cricket. So yeah, we've been told uh, we've got a series, um, but like I mentioned earlier, we're still in national lockdown, so we can't train, we can't do anything. We're still confined to to our homes. Um, we're not home since sure of the venue. We heard maybe Oman, we heard maybe Zimbabwe, we heard maybe um, Dubai. Um, so yeah, wherever it is, I, I guess we we just we will be always be excited to get back playing cricket. Um, and I think as soon as we're given the green light from our local government um, as to when we can train and stuff. So, yeah, it's pretty much just kind of go on our daily runs, daily exercises, do what we can, what's within our control. But, yeah, just stay mentally in a good place, ready for cricket. And, well, it's been excellent talking to you, Ryan. Uh, we've had a great chat. And thanks for uh, joining us on the Domestic Cricket Podcast. No, you're welcome, Caleb. All the best, bud. <laughs>